Mr. Stanton. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Director Ray. Uh, good afternoon at this point. Before I begin, I just want to say thank you for the job that you do, and please pass on my thanks to the women and men who serve with you at the FBI. Their efforts are diligent, tireless, and too often thankless. So please let them know we appreciate their work. I have a couple lines of questions uh, that I have for you. First, I'd like to ask you about an ongoing violent epidemic, an issue that's of critical importance to me and my home state of Arizona. Uh, as you may recall, the last time you testified before this committee, we discussed the crisis of missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. It's a grim reality that Native American women are murdered at a rate 10 times the national average. And for Native American women, homicide is the third leading cause of death. The National Crime Information Center was reported approximately 1,500 missing indigenous people and Arizona tragically has the third highest number of missing and murdered indigenous women and girls in the country. Recently, Congress acted. We passed Savannah's Act, which directs the DOJ to re review, revise, and develop protocols to address this crisis, and the Not Invisible Act, which coordinates intergovernmental efforts to combat this violence. There is a presidential task force addressing this crisis. Uh, our former colleague, Secretary Deb Holland, established the Missing and Murdered Unit at the Department of the Interior, and the FBI has directed to enhance its investigations into missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. So as FBI director, what specifically are you doing to seek justice for these victims? What are you doing to coordinate with other agencies? And what additional training and resources are you providing to your agents in Indian country? I appreciate the question. I do remember our exchange from the last time we testified, or last time I testified before this, uh, this committee. Uh, on this subject. Um, certainly, as you mentioned, there is the task force that's specifically focused on missing and murdered American Indians and Alaskan Natives. Uh, our primary vehicle to engage on this subject uh, is through the FBI's Safe Trails Task Forces, uh, which include not just FBI personnel, but partner personnel from other agencies, including tribal law enforcement. I think we have about 140 give or take, uh, agents that I've dedicated specifically to those Safe Trails Task Forces. That number is actually probably almost double that now in a way because, as you may know, uh, in Oklahoma, uh, the, uh, because of the Supreme Court's McGirt decision, the uh, range of, uh, of crime that's now considered Native American jurisdiction uh, has dramatically expanded to so probably about 140 surged agents to deal with uh, crime of the sort you're describing in that state. I also uh, took the head of our uh, FBI field office in Arizona, but also in New Mexico with me together and met with uh, the head of the Navajo Nation and spent some time with his leadership team and drove around uh, Indian country to get a better sense of the challenges out there, and I w I'm told that I'm the first FBI director uh, to ever go meet with them. Thank you, Director, very much. Uh, I'd like to shift gears a little bit and talk more about ransomware, a subject that other members have asked about. In this case, I want to talk specifically about the issue of ransomware attacks that threaten local government and local infrastructure. Uh, before serving in Congress, I served as a mayor, mayor of Phoenix, Arizona. So I'm particularly concerned about cyber criminals targeting our local governments. And in recent years, we've seen major U.S. cities like Atlanta and Baltimore hampered by ransomware attacks. So based upon the data and pattern of attacks the Bureau has identified, what local infrastructure facilities do you believe are most at risk of being targeted? And what can Congress and the FBI do to better support our local government officials? Well, uh, I'm not sure I could give you a specific type of, of local uh, network that's most at risk, because it, it has less to do with the, um, the type of service they provide so much as it is with their own IT infrastructure and the vulnerability that it represents, combined with the perception that ransomware actors have that they would be a particularly easy to leverage target. But you are absolutely right that one of the trends we're particularly concerned about with ransomware is more sophisticated targeting 
uh, of, uh, for example, municipalities uh, or uh, in, say, states that are more rural, rural hospitals and things like that, school systems uh, as another example. Um, and so we are trying to go after the ransomware actors through a variety of means. Our National Cyber Investigative uh, Joint Task Force leads a whole of government campaign that's prioritizing the most damaging variants of ransomware and going after the entire cyber criminal ecosystem. So by that I mean not just the, uh, the people demanding the ransom, but the malware developers, the money launderers, the shady internet service providers. We're going after the actors, their helpers. We're going after the criminals' infrastructure. We're going after their cryptocurrency. Uh, so we're trying to engage in joint sequenced uh, operations designed to maximize the impact on the adversaries. And then we're trying to feed the information we get back uh, and learn from those investigations in the form of intelligence that we share with potential victims. Uh, so in your example, local governments, municipalities, but also all the victims in the private sector, indicators of compromise and things like that, and then working with CISA over at the uh, Department of Homeland Security to better help those victims protect themselves. But this is, a, I used the expression before, a team sport. This is a team sport where the team is not just government, federal government, not just, frankly, local government, but also, very importantly, the private sector in a whole variety of ways. The gentleman's time has expired. Christopher Ray was flat out lying right there. And the, and the fact is, uh, he is an incompetent director. He was not qualified for this job. I think, I'm you know, a huge Trump supporter, but I think it was one of the biggest mistakes uh, of the Trump presidency was putting Christopher Ray in there. And uh, I think he showed it, especially in this, his opening remarks that he made today, how biased he actually is. Because everything that he said, especially about extremist violence, was completely sided to the left. Everything that had to do with any type of group that calls themselves patriots or anything that happened on January 6th was noted and, and displayed by his language as something that is far extreme with very little, if any, people that were there that, to be peaceful. And he made it sound as though the left is mostly peaceful with just a few things. Everything that comes out of this guy's mouth is pushed to the left, but it's subtle. So if you've been you know, a prosecutor or a, a U.S. attorney or if you've been in the FBI and you listen to his language, you can literally see this. And I, and I think some of these congressmen and congresswomen actually saw this today and I think they went after him, but he's not going to bend as far as that goes. I will tell you that I have spoken directly to FBI agents that are investigating January 6th, you know, um, issues and ranging from individuals that uh, were in the Capitol to individuals who were not in the Capitol. One, one thing that stands out, the, the, the most recent conversation I had with an FBI, FBI agent here in Salt Lake indicated he said he's never seen anything like this. They are given a mandate. They are to go out. They have been given the questions they're supposed to be asking. They have been given the way they're supposed to proceed on this case. They don't have individualized authority. It is all coming from Washington, D.C. I've spoken to prosecutors that are prosecuting these cases, and this is not individualized justice. They are lumping everybody into the same category, and they are treating them uh, like unlike I've ever seen in a case, uh, the Department of Justice is supposed to address every single case, unless it's a conspiracy case, according to the criminal conduct of that individual. They're not doing that. None of the prosecutors mm. have authority. It's all coming straight from Washington, D.C. There is so much energy put towards these people, and there's not the same energy put towards Antifa. Why didn't he explain that? Why couldn't he explain that? Well, I don't think he could explain it because, again, he was making this into uh, more of a political uh, stand. And, you know, he, he said there were three categories of people on January 6th. He failed to completely mention the people who were literally invited into uh, the Capitol building by the, the Capitol Police. And the majority of the people that were there did nothing. He made it sound as though if you came on the Capitol grounds, you were an extremist. And that is just not the case. There were some violent people there. There were some people that went into the Capitol that did some very nefarious things. But his category, uh, the way he categorized these people was absolutely wrong. 
And the way that the FBI has systematically, as uh, Brett just uh, pointed out there, been told how to investigate January 6th, they've systematically been kept from truly investigating or going after the leftists. And that is so clear because of the way that there's just nothing going down about these individuals on the left. And I'll, I'll just say one other thing. In all my time in the FBI, the only white supremacist case that I ever saw, and I was in New York the entire time, was prison-related. There was no white supremacy, uh, massive uh, agenda going on in the United States, and it's not happening now. And it's another example of how they use these things and push them out in the media. When you think about what Antifa did last summer, the number of federal properties that they destroyed um, or defaced, and the money that they caused to small businesses, the, the, the police officers who they injured, the Secret Service members, they really haven't been held accountable to the same type of behavior that they did all last summer. Why not? They have not been. I mean, you think about what domestic terrorism is. When you burn down a police station and you take over city blocks, that's domestic terrorism. And they have not been held accountable. Uh, I'm ashamed to, to say that, you know, my, my former office, you know, the Department of Justice, I, I wish I could see courage. I wish I, I could see U.S. attorneys standing up. You know, it's interesting. I, I represent an individual who... Um, went into the Capitol, um, was told she could go in, and was actually pointed by a security guard to the direction she should go. And she's being prosecuted. She's being charged with uh, misdemeanors. She, she has no criminal history. She thought the only other Capitol she's ever been in is a state Capitol that's open 24-7. She thought you could walk in. She, so there's a, there's a wide disparity a, a, between, you know, who Chris Ray is identifying and they want to prosecute every single person that was there to send a message. And that's what this is. It's message prosecuting. And, and, and that's never a, a, an appropriate decision by a prosecutor.